just to see Peaky World being manifested in a totally new way is brilliant. I can't wait to see it. I actually can't wait for the rehearsal process as well, which is always fantastic. So working with Stephen Knight has been a joy because he actually gave me the keys. He's a trusting man. I think the show is going to be for everyone. I think the show is not just for the fan. There's lighting, illusion, costume, and all of those elements from the different creative departments will help to tell the story. As an illusions director, I like to say nothing is impossible. We're going to do what I like to call visual enhancements that tell the story in a poetic way and will make the audience doubt what they're seeing. It's a form of storytelling through physical and visual action that are virtuosic. That was one of the trailers for The Redemption of Thomas Shelby, or what we have been calling Peaky Blinders the Ballet. Uh, you heard there Stephen Knight, the creator of Peaky Blinders, Benoit Swan Poof. Probably should have looked that up, how to pronounce him. Sorry, Benoit, I've got that wrong. The choreographer and director, plus his team. I'm Angus Wallace and joining me is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshall, and we're going to revisit Peaky Blinders through the medium of dance. So Jessica and I went to see this a few weeks ago and it certainly was an experience. What do you think, Jessica? Is that how you would describe it? An experience is exactly what it was, yes. <laughs> Memorable. <laughs> so for the listeners... I wasn't available to go and, and do this. I was doing something else. So I have heard very little about the show so far, but I instructed them on your behalf, obviously, that I wanted this to come back and it to be a very weird retelling of an experience of something that happened to you both. I'm going to be very disappointed if this doesn't end up feeling like a weird opium dream. A weird opium dream is about right. There is actually a very long sequence, which is explicitly a weird opium dream <laughs> um, oh i'm so, over the moon um it was a ballet i think that's the first thing and it's structured the way a ballet is structured so you get all the plot and the disquisition in the first act and then the second act is a chance for the dancers to show off their talents and, and the, the the i mean the dancing was was it's modern dance it's not classical ballet dancing was really good so that was great but it doesn't feel like episode of Peaky Blinders, a television episode, it doesn't really feel like any sort of war history that I've ever encountered in terms of the, you know, the way historians do. We attempt to impose some sort of narrative structure on, on it, however sort of meaningless. It has a structure. It's a very clear structure. It's the structure of a ballet. I think that was the one bit I hadn't quite expected to be quite so balletic <laughs> was, was the structure. You were thinking the sliding scale of Peaky Blinders to ballet would be more on the Peaky Blinders side of the line than the ballet. Yeah, I was expecting more narrative <laughs> somehow. Well, there, there is definitely a narrative. I mean, it's it's quite simple. It's not, you know, the, the TV series is quite complicated, some of those narratives, but obviously they're multi-episode series and you're compressing this into about 90 minutes, I think, isn't it? But it's, it's also that all that narrative comes in the first half. It does. So they leave at a very dramatic moment for the interval. Should we, should we look at the background first, where, it, where he's coming from? Because oddly... Well, that may help explain what's going on. So hang on. Here's Stephen Knight talking in an interview uh, from the Ron Bear Dance Company website as to where where the uh, redemption of Thomas Shelby comes from. The stage show came about in stages, if you like. Uh, It began with um, a a cooperation with uh, Ron Bear to do the, the Peaky Blinders Festival. I was inspired by that enough to write a scene in series five, um, which involved uh, Swan Lake and a dance being performed at Tommy's big lavish house. And of course it was Ron Bear who performed that. And the whole connection between the music, the dance and what Peaky is became apparent to me then. It was a freezing cold night and people were dancing in very little. Um, But there was something magical about it and it just made, I think, all of us, and I think uh, Helen at Ron Bear in particular, spotted, as, as well as I did, that this could be really something that Peaky, unlike many other TV shows, actually does exist in the, in the world of dance if we make it happen. Just the idea that, in truth, people who don't think they like dance don't know that they do like dance, like me, for example, uh, until they see it. And I think the popularity of dance on TV now 
maybe is a game changer in that people will, will see dance not as something that's for a particular section of society. Well, I was gonna, before we get to the story, I mean, he brings an interesting point out there uh, about audience. Peaky Blinders is clearly what one might loosely look culture perhaps and dance is very high culture so you've got the meeting of the two and it's interesting when you look at the audience how you have the ardent Peaky Blinder fan with his Baker Boy cap and the ballet uh, enthusiast well dressed uh, before it was an, it, it, it's a very eclectic audience should we just stop right there the Peaky Blinder enthusiast was at least as well dressed as the ballet dance enthusiast. Can I just point out th- there was some serious dressing up going on among audience members. I'm assuming you're referring to you two, um, that one of you was dressed in full <laughs> ballet regalia and one of you was dressed in Peaky Blinders. And and even if that's not the case, that's how I'm going to choose to believe that this happened. What, Angus in a flat cap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, they certainly set the scene from the moment you arrive They have all the ushers wearing uh, sort of Peaky Blinders outfits. The, the background music before you went in was all sort of Peaky Blinders based, with the slightly random exception of um, they played some Black Sabbath, which I was sad they could have sure Black Sabbath's not in it. And the only connection I could think of was perhaps Birmingham. But I noticed there's now Black Sabbath, the ballet coming out, so perhaps they're uh, hedging the bets on future sales. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's interesting. It, it's back to this thing. Well, first of all, Historically, of course, ballet, any of these things that we think of as being high culture aren't necessarily. Ballet had a period when it was was popular culture and dancing in music halls is not, you know, includes things that we now think of as ballet. And as I say, this was modern dance. So we're not talking about what, what we think of as sort of classic, what I think of as Balanchine ballet because I grew up in New York. But when you get some of these moments of sort of cross-cultural fertilization. As a historian of popular culture, I'm I'm sort of going, are those are those barriers, divides, borders that we've set between different types of culture that, that actually are much more fluid? Because it 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 works. You know, I think it worked in the television program. I'm not sure how historically accurate having a ballet company dancing at Thomas Shelby's private house necessarily was circa 1925 or whatever it was. But I do remember as a piece of television, it worked. And, and I think as a ballet, it, it works as a p- piece of storytelling. But if you if you go in with certain expectations, I'm not sure what I expected when I... Did you have a sense of what you expected when you went in, Angus? No, I, all I knew was I was fairly convinced that I wouldn't be watching Swan Lake. <laughs> we were not watching Swan Lake. <laughs> there is a feel to it that the dance fits the music there's a sort of synergy between the two, which which gives a sort of a cockiness to the whole thing, which then sort of portrays out. It's almost like, the, you know, those Hong Kong uh, martial arts films where, where the, the, those highly choreographed fight scenes just work. We kind of take that and smush it together with, mu- with contemporary music and a dance group. That's kind of what you got. I was going to say, should we have... Oh, this is Stephen Knight talking about the music on um, BBC's World at One. What we try to do with the dance show is continue the momentum, the swagger that is in the show. And we chose a composer who understands the nature of the show. And Killian Murphy said that a piece of music either is peaky or it's not. It needs to have a certain attitude. Name some of the music that you feel really captures the Peaky Blinders spirit. Well, I mean, there's red right hand, uh, there's white stripe stuff that really works. There's uh, Anna Calvi's uh, stuff it, it, is amazing. There ain't no grave, hold my Certain songs, the words and the sort of the longing and the loss and the, the emotion really make them perfect for... Peaky, you know, it's it's not fun and games, um, but there is a, a lot of a sort of profound emotion being expressed through the music, and it is a combination of story and music that I think has made it work. Industrial is how I would describe the music. I think if it, my biggest criticism was actually around the music, it was so loud. You know, that may have been the venue that it was that the sound design was for a different venue. That music is supposed to be played really loudly. Don't get me wrong, but it, in in places it was oppressively loud and that distracted from from being able to watch the dancing. But 
yeah, industrial is right, which which sort of gets us to the weirdness of the history in some ways, doesn't it, Angus? Well, it does. I would say the interesting thing about the industrial to draw a minor link with, with, with Black Sabbath and heavy metal, you've got this idea of the black country industry, heavy metal, and it is like that. And when people talk about uh, heavy metal concerts being loud, you're right, it was phenomenally loud. Uh, so it sort of almost plays out like an Iron Maiden concert with sort of pants people in front of it. And Because the, the other thing that struck me as well, which had me, I meant to rewatch it, but I, I failed to, other than the Queen bit, sort of links with Metropolis, you know, the 80s redo where they did the soundtrack with Queen, the sort of elements of that sort of all, all going on. So they open in the trenches, and I think we'll come back to, to, to that sort of imagery in a minute. But then they go to a sort of generic industrial scene almost. And it is female figures working in a factory. And they use, so they use that sort of industrial imagery and, and they, it, it's built into the choreography. And, you know, it was beautiful. And Metropolis is actually not a bad sort of visual reference point. There, there's a very early animation of disabled men were walking sort of a jerky line across a screen. That was the other thing it made me think of. But it's 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 using they were using the human body to represent the industrialization. So that melding of of the body and, and industry. But it was sort of generically industrialized. It wasn't specifically First World War munitions. There were chains and then there's a sexual assault that, that occurs. So it sort of lay me, it felt like lay mis and nineteenth century industrialization and the 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 pressures of industrialization industrialization. And it wasn't quite clear how that linked to the First World War. And then they have a scene in a nightclub where all I could think of that's the Kit Kat Club, that's cabaret. That's it's not specifically nine, you know, immediately post it's not nineteen twenties. Specifically, it's really drawing on a lot of imagery that we now come to associate with Germany in the 1930s, although filtered through the night, you know, the 1960s. I, I was struggling a little bit with 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 where the ballet fit with the history, because it. In I bought a program afterwards, which was really interesting, and and I think it's Stephen Knight in the program talks about it being set in the First World War except all the action, such action that there is, appears to take place after the First World War, as, as is true of, the, of Peaky Blinders, the television program. And as I say, a lot of this imagery sort of feels quite generic 19th through to mid 20th century representations. It's hard to sort of fit them all together to understand what historical period the ballet is set in with the the the, the bit that you're talking about in the factory um because i can the, you know the image i have in my my head that, from what you're describing is very similar i imagine to what angus was talking about with metropolis but at the same time images of women presumably working in some form of unison in factories is intensely soviet you know any number of soviet films and soviet posters are immediately coming to my mind of a uh, a very particular regimented form of form of industry is that is that something that's going on beneath the surface the surface perhaps it's very generic heavy industry that has been depicted which I, I would suspect is very generic black country imagery so it fits with a self-image of of what they're doing at that period that probably runs on into the you know the early 50s when you know and seven you know, through the 70s probably when industry starts getting into trouble and starts shutting I guess it's that industry that's sort of portrayed in the TV show that's needing all that network of canals that feeds into the idea of gangsters moving things around. Somehow, though, the the, the, the gangster seems it always seems the, the whole, whole, whole gangster speakeasy thing never s- sits quite as well in Britain when we, when there's no you know we, we don't have prohibition, uh, you know, and it's not quite as gla- glamorous as as Germany. And you try to fit that in with us. And it doesn't always it always always feels slightly disjointed because it doesn't feel like Britain. It's like we're pinching bits to try and sex ourselves up. Do we hear Stephen Knight? Because we're we're getting to the nuts and bolts of the First World War. Stephen Knight uh, does uh, talk about uh, the background of the story 
to the First World War, though he's a bit vague here. Uh, this is again from the Ron Bear website. Following the story, because there is a story, there is a, a, a real story that, that, that is told through dance and through a narrator who also um, keeps people where, where necessary informed. If I do my job correctly, people will follow the story through the action and the movement. There will be an element of people knowing the characters. I think most people who come, not all the people who come will know the characters, but a lot of them will. Um, and we are telling a love story, if I'm allowed to give that away, uh, involving Tommy. And often I think dance lends itself to tragedy and to love. So I think the love story tells itself quite beautifully. Um, and I don't think anyone will be looking down and looking to the, the notes and the programme to see what is this about. It's our intention to not make this obscure, to not make this difficult, to make this a 100% entertainment. Well, I think people will come away from the dance knowing more about Tommy Shelby and the Shelby family than they did before, let me put it that way. So we are going into their past and we are finding out things about them that sort of inform who they are in the television series. What an audience will get is a story being told, a story that they may be familiar with. Uh, they'll get beginning, middle and end, they'll get drama and they'll get brilliant dance and incredible music that I think will astonish them. Now, what I would argue is we get more of the First World War in Redemption of to Tommy Shelby than almost any of the TV series put together. The, the First World War section is quite long and I expected it to be a bit of a two-minute wonder and it was done. But it goes on and on and on. And that's not bad. It's absolutely fantastically done, is the first one. So they, they have a, how do you describe it? It's sort of a, the, the, on top of the stage is a raised stage with a basically a, a what, what, what will be a trench round it. You can't see from where you're sat so they can appear out of the blackness. Unless you're in I think we were sat in the wrong place. We were in the stalls. We needed to be... So I think we were in the right <laughs> place. Because <laughs> you couldn't see it. Yeah. They appear out of the ground, which gives you sort of the impression all the time of rising from the trench, like sort of, or the dead rising like your cues. Season one of the television programme, there's a lot of First World War in there because you get all of Tommy's flashbacks as well as the character with the, with the psychological trauma. So I, I, I think it does tail off after season one, don't get me wrong. But there is a lot of First World War in that first season. And I was referring back to that because I was, they, there's one point where they're crawling along, backlit. So all you get are silhouettes crawling along. And my immediate thought was, oh, they're tunnelers. And, and this, is, this is referenced in the program. They, they are engineers. They, they are sappers. And actually in the voiceover, I think. Benjamin Zephaniah, young men of the tunnelling brigade. And of course, the Sappers had a very specific war experience in terms of that sort of, you know, what, what Paul Fussell refers to troglodyte life. I thought they captured that. And, but Angus, Angus saw it as more generically trenches, which, which I thought was interesting. So I, I saw it as no man's land because they were, because they were not in line and they were in a, uh, a, a long line shoulder to shoulder crawling forward. I saw it as no man's land with very lights going off and flares going off behind them, creating silhouettes, which to me is, was a natural sort of uh, piece of imagery from the First World War. But then it doesn't sit well with the idea of them being from the tunnelling brigade. It's, it's a very filmic image from the First World War, I should say. Well, the whole backlit silhouette sounds very Battle of the Somme documentary and the like. And, you know, every image that's ever been produced by about the First World War since. <laughs> I mean, not a lot of it was, it was. It was just a moment in silhouette. As Angus says, there was a long First World War sequence. I, th I think I think my, my issue with that, you know, the, the programme note saying it is this is a ballet set in the First World War, is that after that long sequence, the love story happens after, as far as I can make out, when, when they come home. It's a story about war trauma and about reintegration, except not really reintegration because... Brutalisation of the war. Yeah. And I think that was interesting because I think that's a distinct difference between this production and the television programme where... It's very clear that the war experience that the, all the Shelbys have 
isn't the cause of their brutalization. That's the their poverty and gangster past in Birmingham. It affects it, it shapes it, it ramps it up in some ways, but it's not the, the origins of it. Arthur Shelby is a brutal and unstable individual prior to the start of season, you know, prior to prior to his war service in the in the television program. Here we get a much more traditional First World War narrative. We start with the war service, and that is what brutalizes them. You know, they come back dead from the war. The, the, the brutalization becomes a rite of passage. They take turns in having to slash someone's throat. So they, they, and it's very visual when they slash someone's foot. You know, there's, there's blood flies off everywhere, which is which really is the most brutal part. That's not to say other brutal things happen. It, it is mo- the most brutal part with blood flying off. And- it's most explicit. Yeah, it's most explicitly brutal. But it, it, it's, it's interesting that the, what they've done is that they've rewritten that 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 idea of when he, when Stephen Knight talks about we learn more about their past. That actually, what they've almost rewritten that that first season to say that the war is a lot more important than we originally said it was. Which to me, actually, you know. That's me as a first world war historian, a historian of trauma, actually detracts from it because, you know, I, I have real issues with this idea that that all the war does is traumatize endlessly and everybody. Because I don't think that was there were people who went to war already brutalized by their experiences of poverty. That's that to me is a historical truth. There were people who, you know, weren't brutalized by their war service. <laughs> There were people who were who who were traumatized by it and recovered. You know, there, there, there's a multitude of stories. So, so one of the things I loved about the television program was the fact that they told one of these alternate narratives of the role of the war. And I, I think I was perhaps a little disappointed that 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 the ballet then rewrites it into a more generic story. The war, it's visible throughout the whole thing. Right at the start, you get Sergeant Major Thomas Shelby blowing his whistle to gather his men for the attack. And then later on, he again produces the same whistle to muster his troops, who are now all sort of the Shelby gang, uh, to come forward. To come, you know, it, It's there. And we've not even got onto disability. No. Well, well illness, illness and disability. I mean, we have slightly, because there is that opium dream. That I was promised. Yeah, if we're going to talk about trauma... Are we going to do spoilers? Well, why not? The the story that gets told in the first half is of Tommy meeting Grace, and they cover Grace's role as as a police informer, which is seasons one and three, one through three, I think. And and they do that beautifully, actually. That that was really effective. And then it ends with the season five death of Grace. She's shot. That shooting's never resolved. Plot wise, it's implied who it is, but but I, it never really becomes clear because what you get in act so that's where you end act one. And then when you get in act two, is Tommy's Nadir where he ends up in a, an opium den, and you get this extended opium dream scene, which was extraordinary. I mean, it, as a work of art, it is incredible. The dancing was just amazing, um, which he then gets rescued from by, well, primarily by Aunt Polly, who's tragically underused in this. So, so you have that form of, you know, medica- self-medication of, of trauma, which interestingly moves that narrative from Arthur in the in the television program to Tommy, and then yes, you have you have the the disabled dancer throughout which I got very, very excited about. <laughs> but do you want to explain that, Angus? Well, so I, I, what, I, what I failed to notice at the start is, did he, did he have two legs at the start? Did they fit him with no. the false legs? He always had one leg. Yeah, he always had one leg. Okay. So, but they have a South African dancer who, with just one leg who does the whole thing as a sort of a, a, an amputee from the, from the war. Uh, and he's just phenomenal. It's quite hard to explain how incredible this guy is at getting about. And I, I hadn't spotted, but my wife spotted that they kept handing him his crutches as part of the dance. And it was all so fluid. You kind of no, didn't notice when he'd not got one, got one handed, chid. 
it was it was remarkable. But it fits so cleverly the fact that in fact I heard the lady behind me whisper, I think he's got his leg tucked behind him. <laughs> No, he very clearly didn't. No. <laughs> and I'm, this is something I'm not entirely sure. I'd, I'd be really interested to know the visuals of the crutches themselves. They've got the, the upper arm cuff that we're really familiar with seeing, which presumably is, is for stability and to, so that they don't go flying off somewhere in one of these, you know, extended movements. But they also have handles and the, the lower structure, which was the bit that was visually brought out by the costume designer. They get they got all sparkled up at one point in the club scene, which I thought was fabulous. Um, he's actually looks like a wooden crutch from the war. Um, and, and you know, we have historical crutches and they have the under, you know, they're held under the arm, whereas these have the upper arm cuff. But that lower bit was and whether and what I'm not sure is, was that costume designed to fit in with the other 1920s, 1930s costumes, or is that the structure that disabled dancers use for the structural stability it gives to them dancing? Because he was quite clearly using that hand rest as a way of extending his body and pivoting and and dancing. You know, the, the, the crutches were, they, they weren't just an assistive technology. They become part of his body, which, you know, is, is interesting in light of the 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 sort of history of, of assistive technologies and, and the, the, the way in which the body becomes industrialized. Um, and this is Heather Perry's work on German disabled ex-servicemen who are then built into industrial systems as workmen through, the, through their assistive technology. So there's a long history of this, but then to use it for artistic purposes is really interesting. It was inspired. And it just added to the fact that when that, I think the end of the first world war scene, they all sort of line up on the stage, all sort of rag tagged and damaged and sort of war torn. And, and then you get this Benjamin Zephaniah voiceover sort of saying, young men of the tunneling brigade, you are all dead, not counted among the dead because your bodies are not buried with the dead, but dead inside. And it's sort of you know, a big bell of the red right hand. And it sort of adds to that idea that they've all been injured somehow and they're now going home as dead. That first one does seem a little on the nose. You are now dead. A, a tad heavy handed. But it sort of fits that again, that coming back from the dead with these men coming out from the, this invisible trench that you get. And when they get out of it, they're often seen rather jumping up. They're kind of almost like the undead coming out of it. I mean, the, the the redemption of of Tommy Shelby. They it is very much the drama is structured in terms of that title. So there is the ambiguity of whether it's redemption from the 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 brutality of the trenches and and that sort of soul destruction or redemption from this despair when Tommy loses Grace. Coming back to that original point that I made about the the structure being very much a ballet because you get all this plot about the fall in the first act and then very little plot about the redemption. What you get is this extended nadir that, that Tommy goes through. And there's, there's another bit after the, the opium dream sequence that's also about him not coping. So it's never quite clear what redeems him. Has Grace's love redeemed him, except that she's dead and that's when he descends into an opium dream. That, that bit for me... Artistically speaking, I, I struggled with. I wasn't quite clear about that. Glancing at my notes, it occurs to me there's actually sort of slightly more mental trauma than I, in reflection, than I thought at the time. Because you've not only got that really weird opium dream, but you, right at the start in the trenches, you've got those people in black suits, haven't we? Sort of uh, dancing with them to sort of give the idea of mental instability, trauma, you know, problems. They're in complete black suits on a black background in, in a, with a black trench with a guy in front of them. But you can sort of see these outlines of shades and shadows around the, um, around the actors as they're, as they're dancing, almost like a second person, a second body who's with each person. It, it, it's all very unsettling in many respects. And it, it sort of, if you think of it, as horror, but not sort of gothic horror, some of it's just quite graphic visual horror especially that, that that opening section to do with the 
with the war and un, un sort of unhuman behavior of what's sort of going on and i think this fits in with rambe it is modernist it is it is a, it is a very modernist aesthetic with a capital m and one of the interesting things about the the program is they've got the ballet with all the you know the stephen knight gloss and and the, the you know d- program with all all the different dancers but then if you invert the program they've got a whole section on rambert and the history of rambert and in the middle they've got a timeline and the timeline's really interesting because it starts in 1888 which is the year that marie rambert is born and it ends in 2023 with the uk tour but after 1888 the next date is 1890 thomas shelby is born and then you've got 1914 the first world war begins my rambert arrives in london giving dance classes 1918 the war ends 1920 marie rambert opens a dance school in london 1923 shelby takes over factory 1926 rambert is formed the first so they're integrating the fictional story with the actual story so this idea of of the company this this specific company and its its origins in this period i think is quite important to the way in which this this was conceived so so having that that modernness that early 20th century aesthetic as part of it i think it is quite important to understanding how this is working by having that kind of very extended timeline that goes backwards and forwards in both directions firstly i like the fact that um you know we've spoken before about the weirdness of ideas of like cinematic universes and like but the, you know tommy shelby and the company are existing in the same universe i think is quite fun and quite interesting but also the fact that you know it goes all the way back to 1888 and comes forward to 2023 they're taking a very creative approach to robert gerworth and john horn's uh, greater war theory <laughs> they're really dragging this out it's again that 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 weird idea that, that this is something set you know having said it's set in the first world war and yet the timeline they've created them for themselves is and and this is when you know i talk about the era of the first world war and i tend to mean this sort of 1880 to to 1939 but actually we're still living in the era of the first world war in this case so uh, have, have we got disfigurement we've covered had had common mental trauma rising from the dead to trenches i mean it's all there what was the weirdest part stand alone by itself we'll strip it all of the context what was the genuinely strangest aspect of it i think for me it was the audience the audience were there they were enthusiastic they loved it this was clearly what they wanted to see when i was standing in the queue to get the program afterwards the woman in front of me the the woman in the kiosk said to her did you enjoy it she said oh yes it was fantastic it was just like the television program i'm not sure visually i could have told you whether she was a ballet enthusiast or a peaky blinders enthusiast just by looking at her um maybe she's both clearly both based on her her reaction and i thought i'm not sure that that was my response but if that was the common response and it seemed to be the common response how people are reading these these histories of the first world war the, these these cultural it's so weird weird is possibly the 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 wrong term but it, for me it was it was the bit that i took away from me took away from it was the the way people are watching this is not something that i necessarily recognize and it's clearly speaking to them deeply which is brilliant but if it, it didn't feel familiar if that makes sense i think it makes perfect sense so i i for a while i've been thinking cuz you know when i do computer game or or stupid star wars stuff concepts of audience reception are actually quite important to that you know there's a difference between what the developer wants or the director wants and what the audience takes from it and if our last episode about all quiet on the western front is any indication we get different things from the rest of the population when we're watching first world war content although the the germans apparently agree with us yes <laughs> um yeah i can i, I can believe that um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know what the audience are taking from it and, and the level to which they buy into it you know if you were to say you know if i was to say to you i went and watched a thing at the weekend and everybody turned up in costume and were really into it i reckon you'd assume i'd done and gone and done a star wars thing and people have been cosplaying and the like but the fact that people effectively dressed up to go to the ballet and were getting some form of affirmation something that chimed and hit their and hit their targets is super interesting you know we we, you know, we we didn't start this podcast because 
you know, we were worried that it might come across that we were reading too much into stuff. And it's not unusual for a bunch of First World War historians to ruin First World War <laughs> media by watching it um, to be the underlying story here. But it is interesting that the gap between gen- general audience reception and what we then as historians picked to bits out of it. This comes straight back to what Stephen Knight says. So this is sort of a swagger to the Peaky Blinders and the audience have picked up that swagger and that's what they're almost mirroring. At this point, should we say that we went to see this in Bradford, which is a, a post-industrial city, you know, we, we, with a strong cultural element. Don't get me wrong. We, you know, Bradford City of Culture is is a big thing in my world at the moment. I think that regionality actually... And we're back to to that point about the music and the imagery very much picking up on the sort of general British culture associates with with the with these industrialized cities in the twentieth century. Um, I think was really important for not just for this production but for this audience. It would have been really inter- You know, I'm I'm sad that we didn't get a chance to see it in London and then compare it to 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 seeing it in Bradford. Maybe we should do that. We should, we should maybe we should tour the region, saying what the audience is like is in <laughs> Southampton, Birmingham. <laughs> can, can we interview you if you if you went to see this in London? <laughs> it premiered in London. Oh no, <laughs> premiered in Birmingham and then went to London for a season, didn't it? Yeah, just handing out surveys. It's just fantastic. I mean, the, the, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that that opening scene, and there was just so many the opening first world war scene. There's so many clever bits, as I say, like the um, people in the black skin type costumes. What is what I did find a bit odd: the female characters are quite central in the TV series. They're almost written out of 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 the dance. The, Polly's in it, but is a very minor role compared to what she has in the TV show. And there, there is quite a lot of cross-dressing in both directions in terms of the the sort of the corps de ballet, for want of a better term. Um, you know, where where it wasn't a specific character, whether it was played by a man or a woman, the, the costume would tell you whether it was intended to represent a man or a woman. I think, which again was sort of playing on some of the 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 cabaret style gender. Uh, norms that we've come to associate, I think, with with cabaret and 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 the like. So have we have we done um, Peaky Blinders, the redemption of Thomas Shelby? Have we got any more anything more to add other than it really is worth watching if people get the opportunity? It, oh, it definitely is. It, it's really interesting. The, the pair of you have certainly been more enthusiastic about this than some of the things that we've watched. I have to say. You came out feeling punch drunk. You were kind of so surprised and impressed by it. I think I do want to just go back to that point that that Stephen Knight raised, and I think we've been sort of dancing around about you know the the audience not having to be familiar with the program, or in fact any of the history in some ways. Angus, your wife has, had seen because my husband hadn't, so we went with someone who had no idea what was going on, sort of plot wise. I think he had a sense of the aesthetic because I watched it fairly religiously when it came out and, and he'd wander into the living room while I was doing this. And and so he had a sense of the aesthetic and, you know, the red right hand as a piece of music is, is of course familiar to him. And I think he spent quite a lot of time trying to recognize the music um, and about two thirds of it is composed specifically for the ballet. So that's a tough ask. It, it, it worked quite well, actually, I think. I, I, th- I think that would, that would, you know, when Stephen Knight talks about about finding the right composer they they did a very good job so yeah, i think matt matt was sort of trying to recognize various bits of music and and i asked him if he understood what was going on i think he did I, you know to that extent i think they they succeed it is a standalone piece in some ways and certainly for, for first half it's also one that you can go in and say ah yes that happened in season three that happened in, in... although that almost spoils it because you second you try to second guess what the hell's going on and which season it is uh we sort of takes you away from the moment of watching it but but i think you do have to to take it as a standalone piece and i think it, it probably works better in those terms i suppose the interesting thing is the extent to which it's trying to be in conversation with the history not just the history of the war and the history of the 1920s but also its own history as a television program and i think that's it doesn't always ex- succeed in doing both because i think that's an impossible task potentially so what we're looking at next time out, Chris? 
we've got a couple of we've got a couple of things that we're thinking about one of them was doing an episode where you know if you were given x amount of money what piece of first world war media would you produce which i think is a very fun idea it's an adapt- ad- adaptations of, of of what we adapt for a film i, th- I think was the, the original question if you, if you could adapt any piece of first world war fiction or or autobiography for a film what would it be yeah that's a fun one um we've also um there's a there's a there's a board game called the grizzled um which ironically in french is called le poilu and that does not mean the same thing which is a really interesting kind of narrative cooperative story game of which there is an online version now so we can possibly kind of play a play a computer game version of that at some point and then report back there's other bits and pieces that you know we're always constantly talking about that there's the new net there's the new netflix series women at war which that we should probably right. take a look at at some point yeah we should we should make use of that later in the year we're gonna make jessica decide which computerized soldiers live and die <laughs> We're still waiting Which, for that to come out. We're still waiting for that to come out. <laughs> um, there's also a first world war strategy game that's about to come out that I imagine I will have to, you know, play heroically for work purposes. Should we put this to a listener vote? We could do it. We could do a Twitter poll. Well, yeah, I mean, by all means. I haven't checked Twitter since the time we've been recording. I don't know if it still exists. It's not a given anymore. It hasn't imploded as of this morning. But I was going to say, if you're listening to this on the first of March and want to check in on Twitter. Uh, we can make a v- vote for what we do next. We can be technological people. We've got it within us. We've got the technology. I was, I was say there's at least four months of, of topics there. <laughs> and we can only do four options in a Twitter poll, so that works out quite well. Yeah, well, we're still not we to Journey's End and everything else that we keep talking about. <laughs> yeah, indeed. All right, well, thank you very much, and we'll see you next time out for, well, hopefully, something that perhaps potentially people have decided on for us. That would be if if yeah if we can get the audience to decide our content for us. It's going to take a lot of weight off off of us um, in between recordings. Yeah, I think I'm voting for the grizzles, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, see you later. Bye. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Oh,